good to see you this evening. I'm thankful that you're here. Earlier today, Keith and I were talking and the name Weldon Warnick came up in the conversation. And He's a gospel preacher and I remembered years ago and thinking about Brother Warnick. Years ago, he told me, Steve, there was a preacher that got up and said, Religious words that end in ism, they're all evil. He said, atheism, humanism, denominationalism. And he said, somebody in the audience raised their hand and said, Preacher, what about baptism? And the preacher looked at him and said, Obviously, you don't know the difference between an ism and a tism. (laughs) Baptism is a good thing. And I'm afraid there are people in the religious world that try to teach that it's not. It's not necessary for our salvation. In the lesson this morning, in talking about the practice of baptism, and we need to preach baptism, we looked at Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the age, he says, amen. Baptism is part of making disciples. Then we looked at Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Mark's account of the great commission that Jesus gives, and he says there in verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And we talked about how people pervert that. Well, this evening I want us to consider Acts 2 and verse 38. I hope you are familiar with this verse. I was told one time in studying with someone that this is a Church of Christ scripture. And I said, yes, it is. And all of them are. And that's what we need to be concerned about. But Acts chapter 2 verse 38 is certainly one of them. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice how Peter says this here uh, when he is asked by Uh, the people that were cut to the heart at the preaching of the gospel and the fact that they have crucified Jesus, who's both Lord and Savior. And they cried out, man and brethren, what shall we do? What do we need to do to right this wrong? What do we need to do? He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Many teach that baptism is not necessary for the remission, and, or your translation may say forgiveness of sins. It's the same thing. Remission of sins, forgiveness of sins, we're talking about the same thing. But instead they, they teach that you experience the forgiveness of sin, the remission of sin before you're baptized. And that baptism is just a symbol of your forgiveness. And only you need to do it if you want to. You don't have to. And they say that the meaning here is is not be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, but rather because of the forgiveness of your sins. And they look at that word for. And they say that that word for should be translated because. Well, I want to share some things with you that I found out. The the Greek word here in this passage, the original language, the Greek word that was used, it's translated for here, is pronounced ice. Ice. Uh, You put it in English letters, it's E-I-S, just three letters. That word is never translated as because. Not in the, it's not translated from Greek to English using the word because. The word because in the Greek uh, is epi, E-P-I, epi. It's a different Greek word. Now the Greek word here that's pronounced ice 
It means into. It means toward. It means pointing to. It means uh, a view toward for the purpose of. That's what it means. Into, unto, for. I want you to look at with me Matthew chapter 26 verses 27 and 28. Here in this passage in Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28, we see the same Greek word is used, ice, that is translated for. Let's read it. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Where Jesus says, for the remission of sins, or for the forgiveness of sins. That's the exact same word that's used in Acts 2 and verse 38 when Peter says, for the remission of sins, or for the forgiveness of sins. So those who change for, in Acts chapter 2, they change that to because and say that's what it should be. They don't change the word here. But it's the same word. And why don't, they, why don't they change it here? Because nobody in the religious world would say that before Jesus died on the cross, there was forgiveness of sins. That came after. It took the blood of Jesus Christ to be able to forgive sins. But yet the same Greek word used in Matthew 26 verses 27 and 28 that's used in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, yet no one changes it in Matthew. It seems to me if you're going to twist it one place, you have to at least be consistent and twist, twist it somewhere else, but that's not what they do. And something else I want you to think about in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. It says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And that's saying repent and be baptized in order to be saved. That's what it's saying. And I'm not sure anybody in, in the religious world would say that you don't have to repent before you're saved. But if you omit one, wouldn't you have to omit the other? Because they're grouped together. So if you're going to omit one, baptism, they're quick to omit that. To be consistent, you have to omit repent. But they don't want to do that. I think that's strange. But they say that you do have to repent. So the passage says what it says, very plain and simple, just like Mark 16, 15 and 16 that we talked about in length this morning. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No one is saved. No one can come into the presence of God. Nobody can be reconciled to our holy God and enter into the kingdom of heaven that's still bearing their sins. Their sins have not been washed away because sins separate us from our holy God. You remember the prophet of old in Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 tells us that our sins separate us from God. And it causes him to hide his face from us. In Ephesians chapter 2, the first three verses, Paul tells us that our sins, our trespasses, make us dead, separate us from God. And we cannot go to heaven still carrying the shame, guilt, and responsibility and accountability of our sins. The only way that we can go to heaven, the only way that we can be saved is to be forgiven of our sins. And the Bible teaches that that forgiveness takes place at the point that we are immersed in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of our sins. And people say, you just make too big of a deal about baptism. You know, so far in these lessons this morning and this evening, we've only looked at three passages. There are so many, though. There are so many, and it's mentioned so many times, and there's so many ways in which it mentions baptism being between the sinner and the Christian. And I want us to look at some of those right now very quickly 
what stands between us and baptism. A person that is uh, lost, a sinner, an alien, and a person who is saved, a person who is a Christian. Baptism stands between these things. First of all, it stands between a sinner and forgiveness, as we've been talking about. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. We read, Buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So the person that has been buried with Christ in baptism, that person has had their trespasses forgiven. That's what it says. So also we see between a sinner uh, and being a child of God stands baptism. You have to be baptized in order to become a child of God. Look in Galatians chapter 3 at what Paul writes in verses 26 and 27. Paul writes, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. A child of God. Before we can be a child of God. That God be our Father in heaven. That we be brothers and sisters in Christ and a part of that family. And he will go on to talk about what it means to be adopted into the family of God and how precious that is. But before we can do that, we have to be baptized. We have to be immersed in water. Baptism stands between this. But also baptism stands between a sinner and putting on Christ. In that same passage in verse 27... Putting on Christ, it says there, that those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have you put on Christ? I don't know of any other way to put on Christ except to be baptized into Christ. Those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. They have clothed themselves with Christ. And Jesus, who knew no sin, took on sin... He took our sin debt and He gives us His righteousness when we're baptized. We put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What do we have on before we put on? We have on filthy rags. Our righteousness as, is as filthy rags. There's none of us that's righteous. We need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we need to put on Christ. And we do that through baptism. Something else that stands between a, a sinner... And, uh, and baptism standing between a, a sinner and being in the body. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. Look in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. Paul writes there, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. There's one body there, one church, not denominations. There's one church, the Lord's church, and you're baptized into that. You remember on the day of Pentecost, those that were baptized, that had gladly received the word, the Lord added them to the church. But that happened after they were baptized into Christ. They were in the body. Are you in the body of Christ? That's the saved, ecclesia. That's the called out of the world. You remember on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. That's what needs to be done, and it happens through baptism. That's where it starts. But also baptism stands between a sinner and being sanctified. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. Paul has been writing about the family. And he says in verse 26 of Ephesians chapter 5 that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Sanctified, set apart for God's work, for his service. 
we're not really doing the Lord's work. We haven't been sanctified uh, if we haven't been baptized. Sanctified, that's a beautiful word. You need to study that word sanctified and see what that means. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul lists those sins and he says, and such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been cleansed, you've been sanctified. They've been baptized, sanctified. Something else that baptism stands between, a sinner and entering the kingdom. You want to be a part of the kingdom of God? In John chapter 3, you remember Jesus was having a conversation with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a believer, but he was kind of a secret believer. He liked to come in the night. But in John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to him and talking very candidly about the importance of being born again. And he says in John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, unless you're baptized, you cannot enter the kingdom, my kingdom, the kingdom of God. Entrance into the kingdom demands you be baptized. How important is that? It's paramount. It's very important. It's very significant. But that's not the only thing. Baptism stands between a sinner and newness of life. In Romans chapter 6, and I love Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, it talks about being buried with Christ in baptism, rising to walk in newness of life. That is the person that has been baptized. That's the person that's been immersed. Newness of life. Things are different. We don't continue in sin that grace may abound. You see, we have the right attitude of sin. We put off the old person. We put on the new. We put away things like lying and we speak the truth in love. We put away stealing and we give to others. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's a newness of life. And that begins at the point of baptism. We become a new creature in Christ. And what a beautiful thing that is. And in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, it says that we have been created as a new creature for good works. Good works. But baptism also stands between a sinner and having sins washed away. You remember Saul in Acts chapter 9 was converted. And later, his name is Paul. And in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, he is talking about his conversion. And he says, Ananias said to him, he said, why are you waiting? Why are you delaying? Why are you putting this off? He says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Sins washed away at the point of baptism. When you go back to Acts chapter 9, you see Saul had a heavenly vision, the Lord speaking to him. Was he saved at that point? I don't think so. You see that he was fasting and praying for about three days. Was he saved at that point? No. Because Ananias told him, he said, arise and be baptized. This takes immediate action. You need to see the urgency in having your sins washed away. It was at the point of baptism that Saul's sins were washed away. And he said he was the chief of sinners. He had a lot to wash away, didn't he? But we all need to have our sins washed away because we cannot stand before God in his presence with our sin. The last one I want to mention this evening his baptism stands between a sinner and salvation. And I hope we've made that clear in the lessons this morning. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. For he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes not will be condemned. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. I've heard people say, how can you refute this? It says it so plainly here. And I'll just read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Look at it with me. 
who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were being saved through water. In verse 21, there is also an antitype which now saves us baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism, it says right there, very plainly, very simply, elementary. It says, it now saves us. You know, I could have kept going. I could have had several more slides. But surely this is sufficient for us to see that baptism is necessary for our salvation. And we need to be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks a question of the hope that's in us. That means that we're prepared to address their questions when they say in Acts 2 verse 38 that four should have been translated because we need to take them to Matthew 26 verses 27 and 28 and say, why don't you have to change it here if you're going to change it there? We've got to be able to give an answer. So we need to understand it. Baptism is so important. We need to preach what we practice, and we practice it here. And we're going to give you an opportunity right now if you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sin. You have the opportunity to do that. And you can come up out of that water, and you can be a new creature, and we'll rejoice, and I think the angels in heaven will rejoice. Because a sinner has been saved. Salvation is everything. Salvation is something that we don't deserve. Yeah, I spent last Friday with my parents. And I've been blessed with good parents. And I feel so undeserving I feel so indebted to them for what they've done for me. And I think about the debt I owe my God. That I've sinned against him. I don't deserve the opportunity to be with him forever in heaven. But he's given me that opportunity. He's given you that opportunity. And it cost him a great deal. He gave his son. He separated himself from his son while he was on the cross because he took on my sin. I don't deserve to be saved. I'm not good enough to earn it. But I tell you what, I'll repent and be baptized. And I'll thank God every day for salvation. Come if you need to while together we stand and sing.